So hi everyone and welcome to the Allied Air Force research webinar for June. I hope that you're all enjoying the summer so far. Um, in Scotland we've been having some really nice weather for a change. Um, it does make a big difference from the rain that we usually get. Um, so I'd be obliged if you would just keep your sound turned off until the presentation's over. It just helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can enjoy the event and hopefully it will stop any delays or any screens freezing as well. Please pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you're watching from today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. I'm a professional genealogist for Treehouse Genealogy and I also run the Allied Air Force Research website. I think most genealogists have their special interests and I was born into the RAF family and through researching my own um, RAF ancestors sort of became addicted in the subject, which I think probably most of you are, are in that, that position as well. Um, Allied Air Force Research are always happy to collaborate. If you have a story to share with our audience, please get in touch. Um, alternatively, if you're struggling with your own research, feel free to reach out via the website and I'll put the contact details into the chat box. During this year, um, we're halfway through already, we have an amazing range of speakers for you. Um, you can find out more via the website and I'll post the link into the chat box. All you need to do is register and you get an e email by return where you can actually register for all of the year's amazing events. Um, so moving on to our speaker for this evening, um, we have James Jeffries. Now let me just get through this because he does have quite a repertoire. <laughs> so James completed his MA in History at Essex um, and is fascinated by historical memory and public history and is a regular contributor to the History Indoors project. Was it was actually the first time that I saw you, I think, was on that event. Um, he's worked as a historical consultant for the logistics of the Battle of Britain by Real Engineering and Junto Media. He has appeared on Smithsonian's TV's Air Warriors series as a guest, guest historian, as well as Paul Woodridge's World War II TV as a guest historian talking about various aspects of aerial warfare. He's spoken at various museums, including the RAF Museum at Hendon, the International Bomber Command Centre, and the Combined Military Services Museum in Malden. He's contributed to the Journal of 20th Century British History and is a battlefield guide at Battle Guide Virtual Tours. And he also has presented at numerous conferences, including the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon, Aviation Cultures and the University of Pittsburgh. So that's quite well travelled, James. <laughs> um, he's an assistant lecturer at the University of Essex, University of Wolverhampton and Northeastern University of London. Now I can take a breath. Hi James, how are you? You can unmute yourself. So I didn't realise I was muted then, I was laughing away. Uh, I'm good, thank you. Really excited about this. Um, so um, tonight, yeah, your presentation's about Bomber Command's Battle of Britain. Now I believe this was the topic of your university dissertation, is that right? Yeah, this was my MA dissertation. Um, so basically I'd, I'd kind of grown up with the Battle of Britain. I'd watched the film and gone to Darksford and gone to Hendon and it was all spitfires and hurricanes and such like and i knew about you know the, the bombing of berlin and the turning point in that sense but um i read uh stephen bungay's book um the most dangerous enemy and james holland's book um on the battle of britain that spoke about raids on the buffer airfields they talked about the battle of the barges and i just went i want to know more about this mm. um because it wasn't the battle of britain that was familiar and i wanted to know how important it was and why that wasn't part of the narrative so my MA was kind of unpicking that and then looking at as well the overall memory of Bomber Command um, and why certain elements are remembered and certain elements are not. And the Battle of Britain was my case example of that. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed researching it. I'm still talking about it and I'm still finding things out as well. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's a story that needs to be told. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Mm. So if anyone has any questions for James, you can place them into the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen, or you can wait till the end and ask your questions then. So I will hand over to you, James. Thank you. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is thank you ever so much uh, for joining. I'll just share my screen and get the presentation up. Is that looking good? That's it, yep. 
Brilliant. Um, so yeah, th thank you for the, the wonderful introduction. Sorry, it's so long winded. <laughs> there's, there's quite a lot on there, isn't there? I didn't realise. Um, but yeah, this, this, as I say, this is part of my MA uh, dissertation. I still absolutely find it fascinating. And it's, it's, it's my area. It's, it's my, it, it's my thing when it comes to history. It's, it's talking about, you know, the, the, the battles and the, the Blenheims and the Hamdens and such like. So I want to share a little bit of that. Some of it is probably stuff you already know, but I, there are like some basics I want to cover and such like. So if I just go over the structure, um, I'm going to start, well, this is essentially in three parts. So I'm going to look at the context, building up to the Battle of Britain, a little explanation of what Bomber Command was um, in June 1940 and the build up to that. Talk about the Battle of Battles of Norway and France. Then going into the Battle of Britain, talking about the essentially what Bomber Command did. I'm also going to talk about Coastal Command. You can't talk about this without mentioning Coastal Command as well. Talk about the raids on Luftwaffe airfields, the Battle of the Barges and uh, the key raids on Berlin. And then finally, really bringing it all together and talking about the memory after 1940. So my findings are that they were very much part of the few. They were very much part of the Battle of Britain narrative. That changed. And... I've been looking at exactly why, understanding in terms of collective memory, and then finally reflection. I think that the narrative is slowly changing um, and it, it's about unpicking that and trying to understand that. So let's start with part one. And those of you who know, that is uh, the Bristol uh, Blenheim, which is a, I've got quite a soft spot for, especially after reading about two group and what they did during the Battle of Britain in 1941, eventually becoming the second tactical air force. But anyway, that's enough of that. So what was RF Bomber Command? I'm sure most of you know, but I just want to go over. Essentially, it's the bombing force of the Royal Air Force. They go behind enemy lines and they bomb what is considered important to bomb. So it might be lines of communication. It might be factories. It might be ports, all sorts of things. It's formed in 1936 as part of a restructure of the Royal Air Force. Um, with this come Fighter Command, Coast Command, Training Command, etc. And they consist of light and heavy bombers. Now I'll go over what bombers were used during uh, this period. They were considered heavy bombers at the time, but they'd probably be what was later called medium bombers. Um, and during the Battle of Britain, Bomber Command was commanded by Charles Portal, who's pictured there, who later became chief of the air staff. So this is a very crudely drawn map by yours truly of the command of the uh, groups for Bomber Command um, just before the war started. So it consisted of one, two, three, four, five and six groups. There would, as war started, be um, the creation of what was known as the Advanced Air Striking Force, which would go to France should war be declared, which obviously it was in September 1939. That would be made up of one group and elements of two group. I'll go a little bit more into detail about that shortly. Six group, it's there. They eventually uh, became a training command in 1940. Later on, they would become a Royal Canadian Air Force group, um, but they have to be on that map there. They are part of the narrative. And each group at this stage operated different aircraft. And in 1939, as Britain went to war, Bomber Command had about 280 aircraft in 23 squadrons, which, really isn't a lot and when you think about the size of bomber command at the end of the war for those who knows it's absolutely incredible to think how how it grew over that period and, and the effort that was put into it so we're going to talk about some of the aircraft the aasf formerly one group are made of the ferry battle aircraft um you've got it there single engined aircraft by 1939 yeah it's most people are working out that it's pretty obsolete it's got a light bomb load there are attempts to think about adding armament and upgrading it, getting rid of a crew member and such like, but it's poo-pooed because it's just, well, we're going to get newer and better aircraft soon. It's a stopgap. Very, very poor decision in my opinion. You then have two groups which are made up of Bristol Blenheims. Now, they're also in the Advanced Air Striking Force, the AASF light bomber. When it first flies, it's faster than any of the RAF's frontline fighters. It's immediately snapped up by the Royal Air Force. Enter service by 1939. The advancement of technology is so quick over this period. It's not really up to scratch, but um, I've got a soft spot for it. And to be honest, I think aircraft like the JOATA, et cetera, really are kind of on a par with it. 
but um, those are those two aircraft anyway. We've then got what are the heavies, as I say, they're not heavies later on in the war. So three group is made up the Vickers Wellington, which um, I mean, for those who think those aircraft look very similar, you can see the Wellington is very distinct because it's got that single um, uh, main tail mast fin uh, at, at the others where the other where the Whitley and the Hamden have the two um, tail fins. Uh, Barnes Wallace, who's later part of the um, designs, the bouncing bombs, the Dan Busters raid and the tall boys and Grand Slam bombs. He's a part of the design of the Wellington, especially with the geodetic design. It's a very reliable aircraft. You could argue perhaps it's the quintessential bomber aircraft for Britain in the Second World War. It's in service throughout. It's used by multiple commands, multiple theatres. Um, very, very useful, used in training. Next, we've got four group with the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley. This is, at this point, the aircraft with the, 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 the best range. It's got the furthest range. You can see the difference between the Whitley and the hand in there um, with the kind of like square jaw-like front of it, whereas the hand and kind of looks a bit like a frying pan. I always think you've got that thin bit that leaves the tail and that round bit at the front. Whitley, yeah, as I say, it, it's the bomber for going to Germany. Um, and then five group, uh, five group eventually, I mean, you could argue are probably the most famous group. They eventually have the S617 squadron. They have Leonard Cheshire. They have um, really, really sort of like tidying links to Lincoln and such like, um, they're, they're, as I say, they're, they're probably the most popular and, and well-remembered uh, group. They're flying the handy page hand and, in a way, the cockpit is a little bit like a fighter aircraft. It's just one pilot sitting in. It's very, very thin. You can't really see it from this, this angle. Very, very thin aircraft. Generally, five group are used for mine laying and such like low level over water. And that, yeah, leads to further things. But uh, that's a handy page hand. And we will be talking about that a lot later on. So we're going to start with the narrative here. And we're not going to go into the details of why, but uh, Nazi Germany invades Poland 1st September 1939 and Britain and France declare war on the 3rd of September and Bomber Command is ready they've set precedence for this war has been coming for quite a while now and the first op is actually launched less than an hour after the Prime Minister announces to the country that war is declared it's a reconnaissance mission it's to check out shipping uh, German shipping and they come back and they go no the weather's not very good but within an hour, Bomber Command has started. This is the start of Britain's war. This is the, the first thing, essentially. The AASF also head to France. They're going to be there. They're going to be supporting ground troops, the British Expeditionary Force, um, should there be an attack by the Germans. But Bomber Command's ready. And there is a kind of popular narrative here that we enter a period of phony war. There's no mass air attack on London. That's one of the big fears. So there's this big fear in the interwar years that the bomber is going to be the key weapon. The bomber will always get through, Stanley Baldwin says, uh, former British Prime Minister. There is this fear that actually there might even not be a need for ground troops. Bombers will come over, absolutely destroy everything, and wars will be over within a matter of hours. I mean, that's the very, very extreme view. Well, the attack doesn't come. The land attack doesn't come. The German forces are busy in Poland. Poland's defeated in six weeks, but still nothing comes. And the British bombers policy is not to attack and risk killing civilian lives. So, for example, they decide that they're going to, the, the heavier bombers, are going to bomb ports. And when they bomb ports, they're going to fly in land first and then fly back outwards again and drop the bombs so that if they overshoot, they will fall in the sea and not risk killing civilian life. This is how it is in 1939. There's also a thing called nickel raids, which is dropping leaflets on German cities and towns. So as I say, the Whitley plays a, a key part in this. And you've got um, an airman there, the, 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 part of the, uh, the image on the right, dropping these leaflets. Essentially, they're dropped on cities, industrial areas saying, hey, we think it's a really bad idea that you're at war with us. Have second thoughts. Why don't we sort things out? That's essentially what they are. Now, they are used throughout the war. There are nickel raids right up until the end of the war, spreading messages, spreading these, these, these uh, various, various documents and such like. But there is a sense in Britain and France that is there really a war on when it comes to what's happening? 
And I can assure you for Bomber Command, there really, really is a war going on. So on the 4th of September, Berlin bombers from 107 and 110 Squadron attack these naval ships. Five out of the 10 Blenins that attack are lost. And to make matters worse, they really don't make any damage at all. Uh, it doesn't help that the bombs actually that hit the ships bounce off into the sea. There was a five second delayed fuse. They are not, absolutely not geared to attack ships at all, these weapons. Uh, and I think the most damage that was done to the ship was when a Blenheim um, collides into one of them. You then have further attacks. So December the 14th and the 18th, on the 14th, 12 Blenheims um, attack German shipping, five out of 12 are lost. On the 18th of December, 24 attack, uh, 22 actually reach, and 12 of them are lost. They're destroyed by fighters, they're destroyed by flak, they are completely vulnerable. The bomber definitely cannot get through, and it's decided that actually for the heavy bombers, they can't attack in daylight. Different story for two group. Two group is still going to be involved in daylight. The AASF is still going to be involved in daylight. Um, but these are the harsh realities of war. And this, this period that's called the phony war, as I say, it really, really wasn't for RAF Bomber Command. So in April 1940, uh, Germany invades Denmark and Norway and British and uh, French forces are sent and Bomber Command is involved. It's sent into the fray, 884 sorties are flown. There's lots of mine laying, which is also known as gardening, and the mines were dubbed vegetables. Uh, they, they drop them, and you, you've got a picture there, the top picture there, but rather long mine that goes into the sea, kind of sits in upwards, uh, parachuted down, low level, very, very um, difficult sort of task to do for the crews. And 31 aircraft are lost in the Battle of Norway. So when you think about the size of Bomber Command, that's a, that's a fair loss. But 12 German ships are sunk, but it's not enough. The effort really, really isn't enough. And the campaign ends for, in defeat for Britain and France and the troops are evacuated. But Bomber Command played their part. They're learning lessons here. You then have the Battle of France. So the Low Countries are invaded uh, by Germany in May 1940. And B Bomber Command are into the fray, especially the AASF and blendings of two group going in in daylight. They're attacking German troop movements. They're going behind the lines and actually other, um, other groups are there bombing these, these lines of communication and such like. They suffer very, very heavy losses. So you've got 82 squadron, remember that number. 11 out of 12 Blenheims failed to return attacking German troop movements. And the ferry battles, they attack the bridges at Maastricht they, and various other attacks. They suffer incredibly heavy losses. And actually the first VCs of the war, two, visa, two VCs to Gray and Garland are awarded uh, to, a fer to two members of the ferry battle crew. The, probably one of the worst days in the Royal Air Force's history comes on the 14th of May when 71 aircraft are lost attacking German troops. Now you remember the Bomber Command at the start of the war is about 300 or so aircraft. This is massive. This is a huge loss. And the equivalent of 15 squadrons lost in the Battle of France, the AASF is absolutely decimated and it's forced to disband. In June, after the bombing of Rotterdam and the fact that by the Germans, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, the gloves are off and Germany is attacked for the first time, Ruhr, the industrial areas by Bomber Command. So things are really, really developing. Things are really, really heating up now. Now, it sounds like it's been pretty much a disaster, but especially the Blenders of Two Group have helped with the evacuation at Dunkirk. They have fighter cover, so they're not so vulnerable. There is less distance uh, for them to travel, so they can have the support of the Hurricanes and the Spitfires and such like. And by all accounts, they do a pretty decent job and are an absolute nuisance to the German troops that are surrounding the Dunkirk perimeter. They silence batteries and they absolutely stop troop movements. So there are plus points here. There are things to show. And actually, it seems like when the bombers come to attack, attacking in the coast and they've got fighter cover, they seem to be doing a fairly reasonable job. So let's take stock on that section. This is the end of part three the pros and cons of what's happened at this, this, this period. 
So there have been heavy losses in daylight and most of bomber command is going to be restricted to night. The bomber force, the independent bomber force, isn't living up to the expectations of pre-war, especially the doctrines that come in. And the losses are heavy and they, they include some extremely experienced pre-war crews. There are some massive losses that it's going to take a lot to recover from. The expansion of Bomber Command is also being delayed here because of these losses. And generally, there are poor results from the bombing. The bombing of the troops didn't stop the troops. The bombing of the Ruhr, the ships, it's, yeah, it's, it's not really happening. There are going to have to be major changes. The pros, though, were absolutely invaluable at Dunkirk. Really, really important. There is something there to be taken from it. There are lessons learned, so night flying techniques, the nickel raids, some people say they're absolutely useless, Well, the losses are low, and they realise there needs to be developments in, in navigation, and certainly with high flying, um, with, with, with the cold temperatures and such like, there need to be further developments and such like. So those lessons have been learned. And Norway and Dunkirk had shown that bombers could be used against ships and troops. Now, when you come to the fall of France, and the expectation that there's going to be an invasion or there's going to be a fleet prepping for invasion, Bomber Command could be a very useful force. They, they can hit ports, they can hit uh, ships. They've proven that. So there is a little bit of hope going forward into the Battle of Britain, um, which is what they're going to do now. Uh, I won't ask anybody to identify the aircraft. As I say, I did go through a brief little uh, rundown. That is a, that is a handy page handling as well. We will talk about the raid that that is um, depicting. So let's talk about the Battle of Britain. So in popular collective memory, it's the Spitfire summer, isn't it? It's um, we think about things like the Battle of Britain film we've got there. We think about the Blitz. We've got the images there, the Heinkel over London there. We've got some pools with the smoke around it. The, and these are all elements of the Battle of Britain. We've got the memorial there depicting the pilots, depicting the fighter element of the story. And this is the popular collective memory. And that's fair enough. And one thing I want to say about this talk is I don't want to take away from that, but I believe it's a much more rounded story and certainly one at the time. And I think that the memory is slowly evolving, but that's that's just a reminder of what it is in popular culture and in collective memory. And Bomber Command's Battle of Britain starts in June 1940. General date is the middle of July when the Luftwaffe start attacking ships. Well, Bomber Command are straight into it. They're attacking Luftwaffe airfields. This is way before the Luftwaffe um, start this effort. It's a day and night effort as well, um, though from the 12th of August, it's at night. There are over 400 Luftwaffe airfields that they have to target by no means an easy number. So there's more airfields than actually there are Bomber Command aircraft. Yeah. And the, as I say, the Luftwaffe don't actually start attacking the uh, RAF airfields until mid-August and end early September. So in terms of length of time, if, if, you, if you looked at that, on its own, you'd think that the RAF with the offensive side, they're going from June to early September. Well, no, um, they're not, but they're putting in this effort. There is, there is this concerted effort and it's building the paper. So we've got a daily sketch um, there from June, 1940, Battle of Britain, RAF on the offensive. That's not what we think. This is the narrative of the time. It's about hitting back. It's about positive. It's not about sitting back, taking it, sending, well, part of it is defending that, but, the, the, but what's happening in papers, the, the uh, propaganda element, if you want to call it that word, is about showing that Britain, the RAF, are doing things. Um, and in total, 1,097 sorties are made on Luftwaffe airfields. I think it's about a quarter of their effort during this period, which is no mean feat. Five airfields are destroyed. Putting that into context, I think only Manston was put out of action. So for a force like Bomber Command to do that with the resources, and you're going to hear about the other demands that were on it, I think that's pretty, pretty impressive. And you have accounts of Luftwaffe personnel absolutely bewildered at the fact that the RAF is still coming over and bombing. How on earth are they going to command the skies over southern England if the RAF keep coming over and bombing their airfields? These are the things that Luftwaffe personnel are saying. And I think it's something that we need to take into account when it comes to the narrative. 
And 61 RAF aircraft are lost in these attacks. So it is a heavy loss. Um, and we will talk about one of the worst days now. So I ask you to remember about 82 Squadron. Well, they're known as the squadron that died twice. Um, so as I say, 11 out of 12 were lost in a raid about the France on troop movements. And on the 13th of August, which is known as Eagle Day, they were ordered to attack an airfield in Nazi-occupied Denmark. They come in and um, they meet heavy fire. Now, initially, they're told to turn back. So the brief is not to attack anything other than 70% of cloud, so 7 tenths of cloud. Anything less than that, they're too vulnerable. Anything more than that, they can't really see what they're doing. Well, the cloud starts clearing, they're given the order and they go, no, we're gonna press on. We were, we we're gonna bomb this airfield. This is this is our mission. This is a, a, a typical thing really, as I say, this, this press on spirit, this getting things done, this, this um, making sure that the job's done because if you don't do it, someone else is gonna have to do it. This is important, you know, their country's on the line. So they, they carry through and they're shot up by flak. Um, Initially, four are shot down, a couple of the others are damaged, they turn to fly home, and the surviving Blenheims are shot out of the sky by German Messerschmitt 109 fighters. It's, as I say, um, an absolute disaster, uh, and 20 crew members were killed, with eight surviving to become prisoners of war, and the, the image at the bottom there with the fight would be the, um, the, the firing German troops there, is actually of the Blenheim crews being buried and being given full military honours at a service by the German uh, personnel there. It's an absolutely tragic story. Um, and yeah, it's part of that effort we think about. So we've got the 13th of August, I think it's on the, on the 15th or the 18th, you've got uh, Luftwaffe bombers flying over from Norway to Britain. They're shot out of the sky. They suffer similar heavy losses. And there's a scene in the Battle of Britain film, whenever I watch it and I see that about the Luftwaffe crews, I always think, yep, 82 Squadron, a couple of days, a few days before that was happening to them. Uh, this is all part of the Battle of Britain narrative as far as I'm concerned. So we then had the Battle of the Barges. So an invasion fleet is being assembled, barges are being drawn from all over the place. A lot are taken from the Ruhr um, district. Now they're very important for industry and transportation. They're being sent to the channel ports. So I think there's a fairly, trying to show they're fairly serious at, at least, that they're taking these things away from industry to, to put them into an invasion force. And this is detected and the RAF immediately are ordered, right, you've got to do as much as you can to, to stop this invasion, the force to destroy the barges, to smash the uh, ports, to drop mines in front of the, the, the exits out of the ports, coast command as well, and a maximum effort is put in, and sometimes there are 100 aircraft in these raids. Now that doesn't sound a lot when you think about 1,000 bomber raids in 1942 and 44 and onwards, but for the force of this size, that absolutely is an all-out effort, and sometimes some aircraft uh, raid twice in a night, and they dub the area Blackpool Lights, because, and they find it relatively easy to find along the coast you've got the light you've got the burning barges you've got the ports so they and i will conclude this later and say how much they do it's as i say an, an absolutely all-out effort and furthering with that there is a there is a particular raid i want to talk about so the dortmund ems canal is one of the points from the ruhr that is transporting um these barges from germany up towards the North Sea and then round into the channel ports. And I've got a very, very crude arrows trying to point exactly where it is. It's a vital supply link. And intelligence, British intelligence quickly draws onto this and goes, right, we bomb it, we block it, we're stopping the barges from coming through. It's gonna require absolute precision. So it's gonna be a low level raid over water. This calls for five group that are used to dropping their mines. There's gonna be a specially adapted bomb hopefully to breach it, destroy it, stop the transportation. It's into Germany, it's high risk. It's really not quite like anything that's been done before. And 49 and 83 squadrons, hand and bombers, are called in to do it. And we have the raid going ahead, 12th of August, 1940. So the day before Eagle Day, right slap in the middle of the, the Battle of Britain. And 
the aircraft come in and they attack and the canal is breached. The aircraft, the breach, it's a couple of lost. It's the last aircraft flown by Roderick Learoyd, who is pictured there, who does it. And you've got a picture there, an image of the uh, of the canal absolutely flooding and, and blocked. He's awarded the Victoria Cross for this action. The Victoria Cross, for those who don't know, it's the highest award for valour in the uh, British Armed Forces. It's the first of 23 Bomber Command DCs of the war. It's an incredible story. And whenever I say it, I, I, I just think that it, it, it needs to be more well known. I, I just think it's got all the drama, all the elements that come into an incredible story. We also have a second Victoria Cross. So people say there was only one Victoria Cross in the Battle of Britain. I would beg to differ. I say there are three. So the third is John Hanna, uh, shout out Claire, Scottish, uh, 18 years old, and he is the youngest recipient of the Victoria Cross for the Royal Air Force. He's 83 Squadron. And there's a raid on the 15th of September, which is dubbed since Battle of Britain Day. How could this be more sort of, you couldn't make it up, could you? It's part of the Battle of the Barges, he's raiding the barges, and essentially he's in his hand and uh, the rest of the crew, the Hamden's hit, catches on fire and the uh, the pilot skipper says bail out so the crew start bailing out hannah decides to fight the fire that is burning he's battering it off with his logbook with his hands eventually puts it out he is badly burnt and the hamden manages to fly back to base upon landing as i say he is badly burned he, he does have wounds but he is given the victoria cross there's an image of him there wearing his victoria cross and the image to the right shows some of the damage to the underside of the hand that he was in um quite a tragic tragic uh, story he ends up dying in 1947 partly because of the wounds he received but there as i say there are as far as i'm concerned there are three um battle of britain victoria crosses we then have the next element of the Battle of Britain itself. So on the uh, 24th or 25th of August, the Luftwaffe drop bombs on London. I say it's London, it's, it's near Croydon, but it riles up Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill immediately says, we've got to bomb Berlin. And this is a crucial point in the Battle of Britain. The fighter command is, is battling in the skies. The command of the skies, very much uncertainty over what's going to happen. There's, there's, there's heavy losses and such like and but. The RAF, to their credit, they bomb Berlin on the 25th of August. Now, it's not a very successful raid and a few bombs land in the suburbs of Berlin, most miss, but it absolutely infuriates Hitler. And Hitler, if you've seen the Battle of Britain film, makes this huge speech about if they're dropping 100 bombs, we're going to drop 10,000 bombs or whatever it is. He's really, really want to revenge here. And it forces a change of strategy for the Luftwaffe. At this point, they're attacking the RAF airfields. They're going to be moving to London. They're going to be moving to British cities. Some people have suggested that that was already a plan. I haven't really found any evidence to suggest that. I am all ears, though. But why make this big speech? And Bomber Command have, have played their part. It's a big thing. You've got a um, newspaper there saying, Berlin bombed by British planes. The British press make a big thing out of it saying, hey, look, we can bomb Berlin, you're bombing London. And this is a mass escalation between Britain and Germany when it comes to the bombing war. And on the 15th of September, part of this change of strategy, the attack on London, the mass daylight raid is thwarted. And two days later, the invasion, Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of England is postponed indefinitely by Hitler. So I think that whichever way you look at it, Bomber Command have definitely got a part in this. They've definitely got a mention in this. They are definitely part of the Battle of Britain. Here. They are part of the narrative. Now, as I say, I mentioned earlier, Coastal Command, I have to give a shout out to them. What were they doing? Well, they'd attack numerous targets like Bomber Command, alongside Bomber Command, Luftwaffe airfields, mine laying, invasion barges. They'd also have their usual jobs of... Um, sea patrols and convoy protection and such like and trying to find and attack um, German U-boats. Uh, they patrol sea lanes and one of the biggest things they did were they were the photo reconnaissance unit so they'd be looking out for the German airfields to look up for airfields to attack, they'd be looking at the ports, they'd be looking at the build-up, uh, the invasion forces and such like, absolutely vital and 
very, very important. And when I talk about Bomber Command, I am talking about Coastal Command as well. The scale of their involvement is much smaller because they were a smaller force, but they are there and they deserve credit as well. So conclusions when it comes to the Battle of Britain. Bomber Command, they put out an absolute all-out effort in the Battle of Britain. The attacks on Germany, really, they're still happening, but most of their focus, especially on the Battle of the Barges, there's a massive focus on uh, the Luftwaffe airfields, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one interesting thing that I find, and I think this might influence the narrative, and these are approximate figures, is that losses for the battle, if you include Bomber and Coastal Command, means that the RAF lose more than the Luftwaffe. So it's about 1,800 to 1,400 aircraft, which I think when it comes to explaining that this is Britain's finest hour and we have the Battle of Britain narrative, it sits a bit awkwardly. So it might suit to not have that narrative in that perspective. And there are over 9,000 bomber sorties in total. Now, OK, I think there's about 80,000 or so sorties by the fighters. Yeah, it is. That's what they do. They get scrambled. They go up. They don't find anything. They come down. Um, that's not anything for the size of Bomber Command, thinking it's about three, 400 aircraft at this point, 9,000 sorties over this period is a lot. That really, really is a lot. And 70% of Bomber Command's strength is lost over this four month period. This is in especially testing and especially demanding to them. And as I say, the Luftwaffe airfield raids, yeah, they, they knock out a few, but there's also this massive psychological effect that's gonna play a part on the Luftwaffe morale. I mean, the Luftwaffe morale, they're already getting this thing called channel fever where they're worried about crashing into the sea and running out of fuel and all this sort of stuff. That adds to that. This is a part that Bomber Command's doing. And it, it, as I say, it's, it's showing that they don't have command of the skies over their own airfields, over their own territory, let alone over Britain. I think it's really, really important. And an approximate figure, again, some go as high as 12, 13%, some as low as 8, 9%. About 10% of the invasion uh, flotilla is sunk by Bomber Command in the ports. Now, I think, if you think about that, you know, 10%, 1 in 10, if you imagine before D-Day, 1 in 10 ships were sunk beforehand, that's potentially going to turn things. That's potentially going to be really, really making things difficult. So I think that needs to be talked about as well. This is all part of it. And again, it's that psychological approach. It's that, wow, look at that, we're destroying all these barges and such like before we've even left. Um, and of course, we've got the, the influence in the change of strategy that saw um, a, a direct change. It saw the, the, the move away from our airfields to bombing London, bombing British uh, towns and cities instead. So we're now going to go into the part three, which I kind of touched upon before, sort of talking about the memory or the misremembering. So I just want to um, highlight the book on the left is the Battle of Britain Roll of Honour, Westminster Abbey. It's put into Westminster Abbey in 1943. Now, the typical figure for aircrew lost during the Battle of Britain is just over 500. I think it's 544. This book lists, and I've got the number here, 1,497. You think that's quite a jump, considering that most narratives, most histories have this lower figure. That's, well, that's three times as many. What's going on here? Well, they include Bomber and Coastal Command personnel. Again, at the time, it was considered the RAF against the Luftwaffe. It wasn't just the fighters. It wasn't just fighter command. The image on the right, so you've got this speech by Winston Churchill, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few, which many of you might know. It's a tribute to the fighter pilots of the Battle of Britain. No, it's not. It's, it's not at all. Uh, and I will go into that in the next slide. But here we have a poster and you look at those airmen there and you think, oh, yeah, look at them. The, the RAF fighter pilots, I bet they're about to dash off to their Spitfires and see off all the German bombers and such like. No, they're actually members of Bomber Command. They're members of 58 Squadron, which is a Whitby Squadron. And again, it's, it's Bummer Command, part of the narrative of the Battle of Britain. And the fact that we've got this idea looking at them that, oh yeah, they're fighter pilots, says a lot about how this memory's changed. The war itself, and there are numerous accounts, um, is very much including all of the Royal Air Force. So let's talk a little bit about that speech. So I'm not asking you to read this. I'm not going to read it all myself before you worry. Um, this is me highlighting. So this is the Never in the Field of Human Conflict. So by so many, 
too so few speech. Now, I've highlighted in white and black the section that's generally repeated, that's generally kind of circulated. Now, in it, Churchill refers to the British airmen. He doesn't talk about the fighter crews here. I then highlighted in red where he's talking about the fighter pilots. I have then highlighted in yellow where he's talking about the bomber crews. You tell me what that speech is about. Um, and he's talking about going forward. He's talking about the night crews. He's talking about the day bombers. And this comes in the 20th of August, 1940. This is before you've really had much of the mass success that fighter command has. This is straight after, absolutely straight after Roderick Learoyd and the raid on the Dortmund Ends Canal. This is absolutely, the, the, yeah, the, the, the attacks are starting. Um, it, 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 I think that we, we can't look at this section without looking at the whole thing and just looking at it from that viewpoint, from that, the colours and the discrepancies. It's absolutely huge. And the other thing about this speech is at the time, there's nothing to suggest that it was directly attributed to the fighters. It's after the war that it happens. It's General Ismay, um, the chief of staff and Churchill, they write in memoirs after the war that, oh, yeah, um, Churchill was at the fighter command headquarters, saw all the plots going on, he went, never in the field of human conflict, blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's about the fighter pilots. There's no evidence to suggest that this idea came before then, and a lot has happened until that point, the view of Bomber Command and their role in the Second World War, a lot has changed since then. So I think there's a little bit of playing around here. Um, I, th I think there's, there's definitely an agenda here and things to think about. So anyway, what does happen during the war? Well, some of you will know, and I'm sorry to repeat it, but it's important to talk about the overall narrative memory. Churchill describes the fighter crews as the salvation for Britain and that the bombers are the means of victory. The bombers alone provide the means of victory. Well, in 1941, there is a report that's released. Uh, it's called the Butt Report, Lord Charwell, uh, Chief Government Scientific Advisor, um, leads this, and it's absolutely damning. Now, Charwell is an advocate of area bombing, which means he's not pro targeting specific things, you know, um, uh, strict, it, it's more about sort of carpet bombing and just, if you, if you destroy a wide area, you're gonna destroy a lot of vital stuff there and if other things get in the way, so be it, which this report suggests is what Bomber Command needs to do. It's not hitting its targets. And there are, there are facts like one in five don't get within five miles of the target and all this sort of stuff, I can't remember the exact figures, but actually the report, there are flaws. There are flaws within the report. The photographs are taken in July. There's a haze over certain parts of Germany, especially the Ruhr, which means that they're not particularly accurate anyway, the bombers. Some of the photographs, there's no evidence to suggest that um, the, the photographs are by individual bombers. Some might be duplicates or taken by bombers a couple of times. And all of these things are raised at the time. But the report has a massive influence and it su suggests a, a change of strategy. And in 1942, We've got pictured there, Arthur Harris comes in, known as Bomber Harris, and starts calling the shots and changing things. It's at this point that a lot of the technology that Britain has put and uh, the effort that's been put into the bomber force, because at this point, it's the only way of hitting directly at Germany. So a lot of effort is put into it. So you get things like the Avro Lancaster bomber there at the bottom. You get things like navigation equipment that, that eventually come in, like G and Obo and all these sort of things to make bombing more accurate. It starts coming in under Harris, 42, 43, um, and the area attacks happen. There are precision raids. There are examples of this usually coming at heavy loss and it's not very attractive therefore and producing mixed results, maybe bad results, maybe good results. It's just not consistent really. So the heavy bombers are here now. This is what we call now a heavy bomber compared to the Whitleys or, or the Hamdens. It's, it's just a, another world. The technology is developing so, so quickly. Uh, and Bomber Command eventually becomes this, this massive, huge force, and it pulverizes cities, whole areas, Lübeck, Hamburg, Cologne, uh, devastated, huge loss of life on the ground. Um, it, it's, it's a completely different force, and it's, it's doing a different task to what it does um, during the summer of 1940. There is one event 
that is very key to the memory of RAF Bomber Command, and that is the raid on Dresden in February 1945. So we're coming towards the end of the war. There's still uncertainties about when it's going to end and how it's going to end. And the RAF attacked the city, which hasn't seen hardly anything at all. It, it's pretty much intact. In it's one of the reasons for bombing it. Uh, and the United States Army Air Force um, bomb it as well, I should add. Harris isn't keen, but Portal and especially Churchill are. There's pressure from the Russians as well, to sh because the Russians are going to be coming in from the east and su such like. And approximately 25,000 people are killed. There are lots of raids at this point where there are huge, huge figures. Uh, and that figure is by no means the highest um, of, of these raids. Questions have already been asked about the bombing offensive and especially later on in the war when technology and such like was meaning that the bombers were getting more accurate. Is it really needed at this point? It's a completely different story to 41, 42 after the Buck Report. Questions are raised. And Churchill writes a memo. So initially he's very keen um, saying that we should rethink our strategy, that these bombing raids are just for wanton destruction and pure terror. He is forced to withdraw on that. As I say, Harris isn't keen on Dresden. He's keen to bomb lots of other places, but not Dresden at this point. Uh, he walks away from the memo, but there is a blame on Bomber Command and, and Harris, and Harris takes on a lot of that blame. He doesn't want it put onto the crews that are just doing their job. Questions, though, deepen, and especially after the war, looking at the destruction, and there's questions over how is Germany going to recover itself after this? Is this... Germany's going to be defeated. Are there these needs for these raids? These are some of the questions that are asked. We then start to see the omission from the Battle of Britain books and tributes, as well as other factors. So there's no campaign medal, there's no memorial, et cetera, et cetera, to Bomber Command, despite 55,000 out of 125,000 or so aircrew dying. It's the highest proportion of, of losses, uh, second only to U-boat crews um, in Germany. It's a huge loss of life. This memory of Dresden carries on into the 20th century. So one book we see from, and at the time and now massively discredited is, uh, historian David Irving, is The Destruction of Dresden. He uses sources, uh, Nazi propaganda sources, suggest that a quarter of a million, up to a quarter of a million people died in Dresden, which is absolutely nonsense. You've also got propaganda um, behind the Iron Curtain when Dresden is under the Russian influence. They're perpetuating this myth, this story. And in the 1960s, I say, Slaughterhouse Five, very popular book, uses the figures from Irving to suggest that the raid was as horrendous as it was, as the figures were as high as they were. You also later have things in public documentaries like Death by Moonlight, which raises questions and absolutely sensationalizes events, misquoting and especially demonizing the British um, and especially Harris. This narrative is entering into a public memory. It's entering into a certain memory when it comes to Bomber Command. Um, and this is, uh, this is all part of, again, that continuation of forgetting, to use one of the word, the story and the things that Bomber Command did that helped with victory. So the Battle of Britain is part of this, but you can talk about raids on Pinamunda, you could talk about various other things that, that are going on. Things start to change. You start to get more of a, a need for recognition. So you get very divided opinion over our Bomber Command. So in 1992, you have a memorial to Arthur Harris uh, Clemson Danes near St Paul's Cathedral has met the protests. Queen Mother's there, and a Cheshire, a famous Bomber Command pilot, he's there. Um, and as I say, it's, it's met with protests, and very soon the statue is vandalised. Murderer is shouted. I think the murderer is uh, painted over the, the statue. There's a little bit of discontent as well because the memorial is to Harris rather than the crews. And I think that actually Harris would be a bit miffed by this as well. I think he'd want the crews to be memorialized first before him, but that's just me speculating. Eventually, 2012, you have uh, a national memorial pictured there, a top picture, Green Park, London, opposite the RAF Club, memorial, national memorial to RAF Bomber Command. I should say that it's publicly funded and fundraised the money to, to, to let this happen. 
There is then, I think it's 2013, there's a bar that's added to the 1939-45 star medal that says Bomber Command. Um, and there's also an unofficial campaign medal that you've got there at the, bot uh, the bottom. You have the creation of the International Bomber Command Centre as well that builds itself, especially on this sense of reconciliation and coming to terms and understanding this and building a wider rounded story of what happened in the bombing war, which I think is incredibly important. The Battle of Britain narrative, it's still largely a Spitfire summer, but I think it is changing. I think we are appreciating the effort that Bomber and Coastal Command put. Uh, and I think that Coastal Command actually have been kind of, because of their smaller effort, have just been overshadowed by Bomber Command in their story. So it's going to be, a, well, you, if you include Coastal Command, why don't you include Bomber Command? There's going to be this whole sort of discussion and an argument. Um, so there is some sort of recognition coming through. And as I said, there is this alternate memory of fighter command there is this 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 good raf and then this bad raf and i use that with with quotation marks and these memories deepen they 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 become more entrenched in popular memory there is as well the memory of bomber command with the dan busters film and such like there is this alternate memory and actually the real story is far more rounded than either of those two there's there's far more to discuss there are far more things to think about uh, and round up and come to an ultimate conclusion um, memorials to the Battle of Britain, so you have um, uh, one near Kent, I, the, the name, uh, uh, Capel Fern, I, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, Capel Fern, that is solely to fighter command. It's, it's solely about the fighters, for example. There are others around the country, I, I don't mean to target that, but it's one example. Um, and there was some controversy because I, I think they, they put a J87 model there as a kind of nod to the Luftwaffe. And I, I mean, my perspective, I, I think Bomber Command could probably be there first or beforehand or there as well. But anyway, that's that's another separate discussion. You've got an image there of the um, Green Park Memorial there that's been vandalised with paint thrown over it. And as I say, Dan Busters becomes this alternate memory to the Dresden memory. It seems to be Dresden or Dan Busters, and it is a far more rounded picture. I think that we did need to do more to remember all of the RAF and the Battle of Britain. I think it's a discredit to the crews and such like. However you feel about what happened later on in the war, that is a different bomber command. It's a completely different um, setup, different means, different things going on. That hasn't happened yet. And of course, most a vast majority of those who fought, uh, flew in the Battle of Britain lost their lives or lost their lives in the battle or later on in the war. So not a lot of them could voice their opinions. And I've listened to interviews and, and such like, and um, generally they're pretty hurt um, to have been shunned from the narrative and such like. And as I say, we need to build this, this greater, wider understanding of the campaign and, and of the Battle of Britain and of Bomber Command for recognition and especially reconciliation. Um, and I, that is the end of it. So I've left that last slide. If people did want to send me something or ask me questions or um, whatever, it's there. And I'll hand back to Claire, I assume. That was amazing, James. Thank you so much. That's all right. Do you um, want me to stop sharing the screen? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, you know, it's funny actually you saying, I mean, about Dresden, my, my great uncle was involved in um, the firestorm, I bombed the firestorm, you know, the Hamburg. He was, I think he went oh, three ops or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, I just wish he'd actually probably been alive that you could actually ask him you know how, I'd love to, yeah. how did they feel i don't know if anybody actually that's watching has ever had a you know a conversation with a veteran and spoke about some of these operations and and, and how they became sort of scandals afterwards um, and i think stuart actually has made an, an interesting point of you know isn't dresden a bit like the kind of world war one phase of a uh, phase of lines being laid by donkeys can I just say, can I just put in there, Claire? Yep. <clears throat> Our chairman, as you know, who's still alive, 101 this year, uh, Harry Hughes, was uh, in Pathfinders uh, Mosquitoes on the Dresden Raid. Mm -hmm. And he did a talk about the Dresden Raid because somebody had raised it on the terms of it was just mass bombing of civilians for no other reason than the Russians wanted it. Harry's memory, which were, at that time was absolutely impeccable, uh, said that their briefing specifically 
was to target two areas within Dresden. One was a communication centre, which acted for the whole of the, the defensive area the Russians were going to be facing. And the other one was an exchange of transport services between the railways and the movement to, mo uh, to motorised transport. So his, his briefing specifically was a war briefing for it. And his memory, again, impeccable, was that they were amazed when they dropped some of their larger bombs that there were immediate fires. And it's because Dresden was a cultural centre mm -hmm. and a lot of the old buildings were still predominantly made of timber. Yeah. So it was, and it created a firestorm like Hamburg. Now, none of that really is brought out in Irving's book at all. Irving's book, to me, is a calumny, really, of, of a mishmash of propaganda from all sorts of different areas. But it's just, it's just to say that people like Harry Hughes did have a narrative that they promoted for many years, not in justification, and he actually used to say, this is not to justify my actions. I did my job as I was ordered to do. But it does put it into context that their briefing was very, very specific as a war briefing. This comes from yeah. Wincy. You celebrated your birthday with us. I, I think, it, I mean, as it's, they were sent out there to do a job. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, Michael, it's been a privilege to have looked after you. I just, yeah, I just wonder, you know, what, what was the... What was the conversation, you know, after it, when all this started to become as if it was, you know, like a big scandal? Because they were just going out there doing their jobs and, you know, what else were they going to do? And, you know, how did they actually feel what what was maybe being said after it? I think it's such a shame. You know, these guys volunteered. They put their lives on, their, you know, their lives were at risk every night that they were out there doing ops. Um yeah what else have we got in the chat let me see i know harry you mentioned about um driftfield the oh, yeah. yep yeah the, the <clears throat> one of the guys who unfortunately again now has died um he was talking about the bombing of driftfield in 1940 mm. and he he was saying that at the end of the war um they were told that the Germans changed part of their strategy for a period of time because of the bombing of the airfields at night or, or at late evening on some occasions, mm. they deliberately targeted um, the airfields where bomber command were operating, yeah. as opposed to the story of they only ever tried to knock out, you know, Henley and all these fighter stations. They specifically targeted the bombers because the... And again, this is his words. Um, this is Tom Sayer. Yeah. Um, Tom's words were that it was it undermined the morale of the German fighters and the German bombers mm -hmm. yeah. because they were going out and then they were coming back to a smouldering ruin. Mm. Pretty much, yeah. This yeah. is the thing that annoys me: is it, it is it is an RAF versus Luftwaffe. It's not Fighter Command versus Luftwaffe. Yeah. And I've seen yeah. narratives of, oh, they bombed the Driftfield by accident, they bombed... So no, they didn't. I mean, yeah, I think the bombing of Croydon Airfield was a mistake, but other than that, yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's an all-out campaign against the Royal Air Force as a whole. So, yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. Yeah, but when you see all these documentaries and films on the television, it's always the fighter bases they're talking about, never the yeah. bomber bases, you know. In fact, I, had, I actually got the file from the National Archives about the bombing of Driffield. Yeah. Week. Oh, brilliant! So, um, I need to need to go through. <laughs> I need to go through that. I think um, I might need a stuff drink. I've been warned that it's not nice, so like, as you can imagine. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let me just see what we also got. Um, can I just say that Leonard Cheshire started with one hundred and two Salon yes. Squadron, and he got his first bravery award with us. Mm. So just, just dream dropping him, you know. <laughs> As I'm all do. for that. Don't worry. I've read, his, <laughs> I've read his book, Bomber Pilot. It's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it's a key source when I was looking at it, you know. Yeah. And then we're talking, actually, Harry's mentioned about the clasp um, and Dan's yeah. 
um, silly bit of tin, some of them called it. And actually, I've got my great uncles, um, and it is, it's like, it's tin, it looks plasticky, it's cheap looking, it's like a bit of an insult. Oh, nice as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sensitive Japanese tissue, which I can iron on. Sorry, that's probably at the back of me, I've not shut the door. I wonder what that was, so... Is that me? <laughs> I think he's multitasking. You're multitasking. No, it's, it's all right. My wife, my wife's watching repair shop. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry about that. Does anyone else have any questions for James? No, it's an excellent presentation. Really enjoyed that. Thank it's you. A, it does put, a, put the right context on it. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thank well, you. Thank yeah. You. yeah it's not spoken about enough, James, and I think no. you know, actually putting it out there is fantastic. Um, it needs the, to be said. The first book you get is Larry Donnelly, who served on Whitley's, I can't remember which squadron, um, during the war. And th that's a fantastic book. It absolutely lists all the operations. There's this narrative before and afterwards with the memories and such. That was a huge influence on me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And yeah, I think you've got one by Paul Twiddle as well. Twiddle, Twiddle, I can't remember his name. Um, that tells the story from the Irish perspective. Very useful for a narrative on that sense. But I think that when it comes to explaining this story, you, you need to talk about the context of what happened afterwards, the post-war memory, and also the wider things with the Battle of Britain and what the Battle of Britain means in, in British collective memory, because that is a, a key part in, because you listen to this and you, 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 you hear the stories, and, you know, Leroy or whatever and you go well, why isn't this known you know and there's all these things that there's all these excuses you know and I think that one of the ones is um oh the battle of the barges oh it wasn't important because there wasn't going to be an invasion anyway and it's like they didn't know that at the time yeah. and the fact that this all our effort is put in shows just how seriously it was being taken and I think that's something that needs to be uh discussed and and, and something to be aware of when it comes to this narrative you know I mean, I think I think one of the things that comes to my mind, and I know Dan Ellen's uh, listening in, is that it, it lends itself to a, a little bit of a one-off event mm. of some sort of presentation, like similar to what you've done at the IBCC at Lincoln, um, because we've had the humanitarian, the, the Operation Manor, the reconciliation side, but in general terms, the element of the the very early days of the war um <clears throat> it's not that they skated over but it's it's such a general picture and every now and then i do get the feeling we ought to have sort of targeted sections uh showing and things like the battle of britain contribution mm -hmm. is is an important uh, aspect i think uh so perhaps if you speak to dan and uh, nikki van der drift and Get yourself back up to Lincoln again. That that might be uh, that might be profitable for us. I'd I'd love to visit again. Yeah, I, I really would. Great to see Dan again. I, I got to meet him uh, uh, last time I was up. Yeah, I, that's the thing is we, with, again with the narrative is it's bomber command the dismissal of just like oh whatever before Harris comes in. And it's like whoa 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 whoa. This is really important understanding not only how the bombing war escalated but also how Bomber Command built its identity. And there's quite, a, I mean, the Battle of Britain's pretty huge to be involved in. If you're going to be involved in a campaign in the Second World War, you know, and I think that there is a huge involvement and I think we need to talk about it and appreciate it when it comes to the narrative. Mm -hmm. I haven't guessed already. Yeah, and I mean, I was really interested to hear about this guy, John Hanna. I'm definitely going to look at him. I noticed he's from yeah. Paisley, so he's not too far away from where I am. Yeah, it's a really sad story when right, you uh, yeah. read into it. Yeah, mm -hmm. just, and just he just, I mean, I know, he, I know he was 18, but he looked so much younger than that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think, gosh, my nephew's that sort of age to think, yeah. of, you know, him going through something like that and having to deal with some of the things, you know, it's just, yeah, it doesn't be thinking about yeah. really. So, yeah, I'm going to have yeah. a look at him as well. But thank you so much for your presentation. Lots of lovely comments in the chat. Um, great wonderful. presentation. Really interesting presentation, very good talk. Um, I think actually Hazel said she's a complete novice. She's learned so much tonight, thank you. I think we all learn, you know, we get to know a lot and then you learn, you keep learning more all the time. Yeah. And you're probably the same, James, you get to hear things. 
oh my goodness yeah, he, even this I, I wrote the dissertation and I handed it in and within months I was finding things again I wish I'd included this and even now <laughs> yeah. going oh my goodness so it never ends you, you, yeah it absolutely never the more you think you know the less you realize you actually do <laughs> and I, I think when you do because I mean my dissertation was obviously for genealogical studies but then there's that privacy period so when i yeah. did my dissertation i went back and looked at things a few years later and then there were so many more records had actually been yeah. released so you get to learn more and i mean really i keep thinking i should go back and update all that you know there's too many other projects there really yeah. is you know? the other thing is i really want to i did some stuff on the german side of things i really really want to build on that i really want to find out more because some of the stuff i was finding was really really fascinating about for instance, the attacks on the Luftwaffe airfields and such like. So yeah, there's if, a, if there's a book one day, you never know, hopefully, um, that's definitely something I want to build on. And there's so much more work to do. Someone sent me a link recently now. Don't quote me on it. I can get it for you. Yeah. Um, I think it was something to do with, it was maps of where they were going to bomb in Britain. And it, whether it was where they actually bombed, but it was all these maps and all the reports, oh, all the German reports. And I think it's one of the archives in America, because I think the benefit with some of the American archives is they've got the budget to digitise a lot of these records. Yeah. I'll send yeah. the link on to you. I'll that would be fantastic. Yeah, you, I looked, yeah, I had a look and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Because where I live, you know, near Glasgow, obviously the Clyde, um, yeah. you know, they've bombed quite a lot during the Battle of Britain as well. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've actually got in my cupboard a stone from the Houses of Parliament because when it was bombed during the Battle of Britain, they sold off the stones and there's a little plaque on it that says this stone came from the Houses of Parliament and they oh, sold wow. it off as a way of raising money to start rebuilding the damage. And my grand sister was down um, in London working as a nurse at the time and bought this stone. So it sits, in, it sits in my cupboard. It's quite heavy. <laughs> but I remember in you know primary school and my World War project taking me to school as my kind of show and tell. <laughs> I think Amazing. someone had their hand up there a minute ago. William, was it you? Was it going? Uh, yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, James, fantastic. Um, lovely to get that take now. Uh, really, it needs to be very, made very much more of. Um, I've done quite a bit of research on the, um, the that period of the Battle of Britain, uh, but particularly the, the Battle of France mm. uh, and the, the sheer number of losses in the Battle of France. And you know, they, they are completely glossed over. The attack on the bridges of the Mars and the uh, Nader Rhine uh, by the battle squadrons, where they were literally getting shot out of the air in droves uh, by the uh, by the flak because they were coming in at low level. Um, the precision bombing, though, they actually did put a number of the the bridges out of action. Yeah, the loss rate was absolutely phenomenal. Um, so, thanks very much for a very very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we finish up, let me just see what else I've got for next next month yep yeah. so next next month's webinar um it's not the wednesday because i'm actually involved in a client's family gathering for two days which is quite exciting i've got a presentation to do for his whole family um so rather than the wednesday next month it's going to be the thursday so it's thursday the 27th of july at 7 pm the speaker will be brian fear who will provide a presentation the balloons going up this presentation will look at the life of second lieutenant now, this is a, a name that I'm hoping I get it right. Elfric Ashby Twydale, quite a name. The grandson of the long-standing vicar, Joseph Twydale of Melton Mowbray Baptist Church. Elfric's father, Ashby, emigrated to Canada where he set up home, married and raised his family. Elfric joined the local militia when he turned 18 and enlisted into the Canadian Overseas Expeditionary Force at the outbreak of World War I. He served with the number two Eton machine gun battery before taking his commission with the Royal Field Artillery. Shortly after being commissioned, he was promoted to temporary captain commanding a trench mortar battalion. Stuart, sorry, I don't like my second. I think it's maybe the sound. I'm just thinking Right. I think it's Harry's telly again. I've muted you for a second, Harry. Sorry about that. Um, 
let me just get that back up. I don't know where you got to, Stuart, so we'll just um, go back a bit. Uh, yep, so his father, um, Ashby, emigrated to Canada where he set up home, married and raised his family. Elfric joined the local militia um, when he turned 18 and enlisted into the Canadian Overseas Expeditionary Force at the outbreak of World War I. He served with the number two Eton machine gun battery before taking his commission with the Royal Field Artillery. Shortly after being commissioned, he was promoted to temporary captain commanding a trench mortar battalion. After this command, he was assigned to the Royal Flying Corps and became an observer known as a balloonatic. Whilst up in the air over the Arras battlefield in 1917, he was killed. Uh, Brian will be joining us next month. I have put a link into the chat uh, for the Zoom, so you will be able to click on that and join, sign up for it for next month. Uh, what else have we got? Um, as I said, pen and sword books, I do work a lot with them, and as you know, I've been interviewing some of their aviation authors. They stock an amazing range of aviation books and I've put a link into the chat. Go and check these out for yourself. And also, um, we have our own Facebook group. Check out the Allied Air Force Research Facebook group. It's an amazing place to chat about what you're researching, get second opinions and a bit of help and meet like-minded people. And I've placed a link into the chat for that as well. Does anyone have any questions before we finish up? No. I do the automatic sort of academic thing and say it's not so much of a question as a statement. No. Um, <laughs> I was really taken by the stats that you had that in the Norway, the, the RAF sank 12 ships. Um, and I think I, I, I posted a question uh, which about uh so mining is a more efficient way of of getting rid of enemy shipping than the direct attacks um but of course you don't uh you don't get to be heroic dropping a mine and a mine will sink a ship days or weeks later um and attacking a, a capital ship that's shooting back at you 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 seem to be heroic you you know there's a terrible chop rate and people win, win medals and that just doesn't fit into this this narrative of um being heroic so yeah i think the the thing that i'm going to take away from this talk is the work that bomber command and the coastal command did um in in the period known as the battle of britain and stopping the invasion um it's partly been forgotten because it's much less glamorous and you know bomber command gets remembered for heroic bombing operations mm. it doesn't get remembered for what might have been very effective and, and it's mine laying so that was that's that was what all I wanted to add to this. Yeah, but yeah. great talk, thanks. <laughs> I think I was quite surprised actually when you were talking about you know aircraft getting hit by flak in September thirty nine, because mm. it's right at the very beginning, and you just don't really think, well, were they that were mm. that that organised that they had the flak guns all set up and ready? But yeah, there must have been, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and as I say, the, even the the, the Luftwaffe defences are, are still fairly crude at this point. So it is, it's just how vulnerable those aircraft were and the, the flak would often scatter them and then they'd be on their own and then they'd be completely vulnerable to the German fighters. I mean, I was reading uh, Stephen Bungay's book that said that um, the, uh, the German fighters provided nice targets, except that they'd attack in blind spots, which wasn't very sporting of them, mm. um, which, yeah, there, there's all these things that need to be learned and, and, and such like, and um, they are completely vulnerable at this point. You don't have things like self-sealing tanks, so a lot of the aircraft burn incredibly easily, so they really don't need to be hit much at all. Mm. And uh, I think that the, some of the Wellington crews come back and claim they shot down like a dozen 109s. They did shoot down a, a couple, I can't remember the figures, so the gunners do do their job to a certain extent, but yeah, they're, they're just proven to be completely vulnerable. Um, and, and you see it throughout the war. I mean, you see it when the Luftwaffe attack unescorted over Britain. You see it when the American Air Force goes over and they're unescorted. Bombers just can't protect themselves. Yeah. Um, this, this is the fact of it. And I don't think there needs to be a great set of preparation for it, really. They're just that vulnerable. I mean, you take it back to the basics. You've got this this aircraft that at this point, you know, has fabric. 
it's got high octane fuel it's got oxygen it's got all of these things that just ammunition it's bombs it's got all these things that just want to explode mm -hmm. so yeah it doesn't really really take much mm -hmm. james i think you had a question yeah it's just i'm wondering with the losses perhaps a function of a relatively slow aircraft at not a considerable altitude giving the, the german gunners quite a bit of time to draw a bead on them i mean someone yeah. facetiously made a joke about it quickly it was so slow the gunner could uh, draw a bead in the aircraft go off have a cigarette come back and still shoot it down because the damn thing was so slow I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how much that the aircraft were relatively slow, relatively low that played into the hands of the, of, of the uh, Luftwaffe uh, flight batteries. Yeah, that's definitely a, a very, very good point. They are incredibly slow. That adds to their vulnerability. Um, but I, I can back that up with the Whitleys that were shot down in 1940 um, because uh, we lost um, DYR and they were trying to bomb the bridges at Ribamont um, to slow down the armoured advance. And they were flying out in late summer um, daylight, evening daylight. And the Germans, um, one of the German flat crews, I'm trying to remember what book it was in, described it as um, like shooting um, birds because the flat guns had time to actually apply lead in front of the aircraft to make sure they hit them because they were so slow they didn't have to follow them and try and get ahead they were already ahead when they opened fire um and of course the the other thing was the heights that they were bombing at because like bombing the bridges at ribamont they would normally have been bombing at say nine or ten thousand feet but to do that job they were bombing at two thousand feet well, two thousand feet for a, even even in nineteen forty was nothing for the German flat gunners because they'd had they'd had the training in Poland. The Polish Air Force put up a, a really good fight before they were all decimated. Um, but the Ger the German uh, flat gunners were, were were had got a lot of experience, and they were placed deliberately placed at the target areas that were made them vulnerable for the move down into through the Low Countries and into France. So. You know, it's right what James says about they were so slow. Um, and I think that that was the end of the Whitley anyway. The Whitley was on its way out in 1940 anyway. Yeah, it was. It was used a little bit for um, uh, parachuting and, and trying that out. But yeah, it's essentially... Yeah, yeah. They did, I mean, yeah, they did all sorts. They did glider. Um, yeah. One of the main things they did, I didn't realise, was the Whitley was converted very much like the Hamden had been converted to fly agents and stuff yeah. into yeah. SOE in Northern France. Yeah. Um, there's a lot placed out in Cambridgeshire, apparently, but I've not really read up on that because that's not 102 Salon Squadron. No, I know, but it's fascinating. <laughs> I, really want, I really want to get into that as well. I've got to go. Thanks ever so much, James. <laughs> no really, really interesting. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, James, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been amazing and given us all something to think about. Thank you so much for your time tonight. My pleasure. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, we did. We did. Thanks, everyone. And we we'll look forward to seeing you next month if you can make it. Take care. See you, Dan. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.